the announcement by USDA came a bit after some of the initial planning was done. So, so I thought it would be better to kind of look forward at the, at the traceability program and give you, as we've heard a lot in the past, I'm not going to give you the state perspective. I'm going to give you a state perspective from California because I think all of us in, as state veterinarians are, are anxious to visit with USDA over the next two days and, and uh, put our heads together and see if we can't come up with some ideas that will work uh, well for our industries. So I'm going to take you through a uh, recent disease issue we had in California. I know I've, I've presented on our tuberculosis issue, but I'm going to do it in a, in a way of traceability and try to emphasize uh, the, the need for traceability and maybe emphasize if, if we can look at different drivers for traceability uh, for, for our industries. And I'm going to concentrate primarily on the cattle industry because that's where much of the pushback has come from. Uh, traditionally, those of us in the states have had excellent relationships. Uh, we've had trust with our producers. They've understood our programs. They've understood why we need pieces of these programs. So I think I'd like to emphasize some of those issues today as we move forward. So I'm going to go through just a few disease issues, concerns, talk about some movements of interest, traceability tools we currently have, some gaps, and, and finish with some uh, very specific recommendations. So let's start with, and I'm going to focus as I said, on our disease programs, and I'm going to, you know, here's some examples of the, of, the, of the programs we currently have that we need good traceability for. And many of these overlap. Many of these are, are examples of in cattle. Again, I'm going to probably emphasize that as much as uh, anything. Uh, ultimately, we, we want, you know, I think we all believed in the principle of 48-hour traceability because if we have to have a foreign animal disease like foot and mouth disease traced, we know that's got to be at the speed of commerce, but we all recognize we're a long way from that. We're going to just, you know, and I think if we can put a traceability system that works for our other programs, our day-to-day -day, uh, program diseases, I think we'll be a long, a long way. And I would challenge any producer in the audience or, or anywhere to, to convince me we can eradicate TB without traceability. Knowing what we've, what we've been through the last several years, the last several decades, it's getting worse, folks, instead of better. And I would challenge, again, any producer or anybody to, to, to convince me we can eradicate that disease or, or any of these diseases up here without, without some traceability. So just as a reminder, uh, many of you have seen these types of slides. I'm going to go through these really quickly. But I think it emphasizes how important traceability is, how important ID is at different parts of the system. We all know Michigan, Minnesota are fighting a, a wildlife issue up there. So there's been some chronic exposure. Uh, uh, Minnesota has been extremely uh, 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 diligent in, in moving rapidly, and I really commend Bill and the folks up in Minnesota. Michigan's been fighting this a lot longer, uh, and, and likely the, the, some of those issues are going to be around a while. But most of those herds up there are found on live animal tests, and of course we need good identification. We do those tests. But the rest of the country, most and a lot of our herds are found at slaughter. So it's a reminder how important it is that we have identification on those high-risk animals at slaughter. So it's important that the producers, markets, vet accredited veterinarians, we have that ID in. But it's equally as important that that ID is collected. And I think that's something we, we, we need some significant investment in because that's not, that's not always occurring. And if you remember, TB is still a fairly frequent event, and it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, here, here's cattle cases, and again, the majority of those have been on uh, fed cattle. But lately, and Bob Meyer showed us some information at our Western meeting a couple weeks ago. The fed cattle, the Mexican import cases have been going down, but yet adult cattle and some of our domestic cases have been at least staying the same and in some cases increasing. This map is to try to make a point, and there's a lot of states that are green there, but there's a lot of activity, even though there's not a little animal or an icon of some kind there. Since October of 2008, there's been 16 newly affected TB herds in the United States, uh, including beef, dairy, and cervid herds stretching from California to Texas up to Minnesota, Michigan, New York, uh, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, uh, Indiana, so, and, and then a lot of activity and tracing in a lot of states in between as well. Uh, if I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was in Pennsylvania that the slaughter trace led back to one of the, the cattle cases. Uh, and, and so, I, you know, we're all in this together, and we, we've got a lot of cattle moving in a lot of different directions. I stole this slide from Dr. Meyer. I edited it just a little bit. Uh, I hope Dr. Ellis doesn't mind me showing this. 
But here's an example of an ongoing trace right as we stand here today. Uh, give a lot of credit to, to Texas for pushing hard on their accredited veterinarians to teach them how to do an appropriate caudal fold test. Uh, all of us have to take that responsibility. This, was, this herd was found by an accredited veterinarian. It was a dispersal sale. And by the time they found it, a lot of animals had already moved out of that herd. So 22 states involved, over 5,000 exposed heifers. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work there, and, and if we don't have good tracing, we're going to be doing even more work. So, again, just trying to emphasize, again, this isn't a Texas issue. It's not a California issue. This is a national issue when 22 states are involved in a single trace. And depending on the class of cattle, some of these cattle move from, from Texas, a free brucellosis and a free TB state at the time without any ID requirements. So I think that's something else to keep in mind. I reached back into our archives to demonstrate. Some of you may have seen some of these before. You're not intended to be able to read any of this other than each one of those little white spots is a trace. Here's trace ends on one of our index herds in California back in 2002. Here's some trace outs from the same herd. That's a lot of work and a lot of trace, and without good identification, hard to get where you need to go. Here's some examples. We are an importing state in California. We get cattle from all over the country on a, on a daily basis. Our first herd, 33 states, based on the silver or brucellosis tags in that herd. Second herd, over 20 or 22 states. And the third herd, we had five states represented. Again, 2009, we went through this again with, four, uh, with, with additional uh, TB cases. Four herds uh, uh, this time, but three uh, different uh, uh, sources of, of TB. But again, here's, here's some of the trace ins. There's some of the trace outs. Do you see a pattern developing here, folks? Convince me I can eradicate TB without traceability. Where did this disease come from? We never did figure it out in any of these herds. So all that, we spent tens of millions of dollars in California on four affected herds, and we found eight positive cows, 659 traces, 21,000 animals. And you see the numbers, you know, 419,000 cattle tested, over 250 herds, 300 herd tests, brought people from all over the country in. RFID, most of these were dairy herds. Despite what we hear, typically, the dairy industry likes RFID generally in my state. And I think we're going to find that true. So while we're talking about cheap, we're talking about simple, I agree, let's, let's focus on that. But the segments of the industry that want more sophisticated and, 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 and uh, better, uh, better uh, ID mechanism, let's give it to them. And I think many of our dairy industries and probably others uh, very much will support uh, RFID. So let's have, let's have that opportunity, that choice. We really found, and we put RFID in every, every time we went out and did a herd test. We typically gave the, uh, gave the tags to the owners. We, it, was, it was very well received by the producers. On a very rare occasion, did we get much pushback? The industry uh, put them in. We gave them a couple weeks ahead of time. They put those in. It, and also, when, when we found suspect animals and sent them to slaughter, we were able to rapidly uh, uh, reconcile the information from the farm and back through slaughter through that, I, through that RFID system. So, and we, we collect that information automatically. It goes directly into our databases, and it, it's, it's just a, a really nice system. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that system available for our day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Some lessons learned, you know, with RFID, especially in these big dairies, many of these herd, you know, a lot of this work was done in the summer. A lot of, a lot of times our crews were starting before daybreak. Tough to read those little, those, little, those little silver tags in a dark barn with a flashlight with manure on them and the head moving around. Transposing numbers, I heard that a lot from, from my counterparts. You know, when you write down a seven-digit number, a 14-digit number, an 18-digit, you know, longer that number goes, the more likely you are to transpose numbers, and it, it's hard work, and, it, and we make a lot of mistakes. So that's an important thing to remember when we're reading uh, official ID and we're determining what kind of official ID uh, we need. And speed, obviously, is a, is a huge issue. So let's just touch a little bit on animal movements. Obviously, our international movements are critical. Uh, we probably are more concerned in California at our southern movements uh, coming in from Mexico. I, I, I guess I would ask you, if, if we give Mexico ID information, might they do a better job today of tracing that back to the herd origin than we can do? We often don't have that ID. That's because somebody took it out once it crossed the border. 
But if we have that ID and we can give it to the Mexican officials, most of the time they can get back to a herd of origin because ID has been critical for their ability to move cattle into the United States. We bring in a lot of cattle, uh, 55,000 imported last year, and these are the ones we know about because once they cross into Texas or New Mexico or Arizona, we don't have a port in California. They become U.S. citizens. They can come into our state just like domestic cattle. There's nothing to prevent that. We, we graze a lot of cattle. We know they're often uh, you know, near our, near our uh, uh, domestic cattle. And then change ownership, obviously we don't collect any information when that occurs. I know I've listened to my, my friend Dr. Eldridge and some of the challenges from Canada. He shared an example with us. Uh, since B, the BSE incident, we get very few heifers and, and, and dairy animals like we used to. Uh, but I know uh, those, those animals moving in from uh, Canada just as important as the ones from, from Mexico. Interstate movements, again, this is just a few slides to emphasize many of the states in the West, we are importing states. A lot of those heifers, especially on the dairy side, uh, come this direction. A lot of our, our feeder animals, of course, go, go to the Midwest for feeding. Uh, 39,000 shipments. We actually have border inspection stations in California because we have 350 uh, specialty crops, many of which get pests that uh, other states have and we're trying to keep out of California. So this inspection stations are generally funded and, and staffed by our plant health people, but they stop trucks, they collect passing information and give that to us on a regular basis. So, you know, we had uh, 39,000 shipments were reported, over 17 million animals coming through those ports uh, last year. We also issue permits for certain classes of animals. Those numbers are there, more of the breeding side. Again, just some of the, ans some of the, some of the numbers, just to, again, just to emphasize, uh, see a lot of swine. We're not a, we're not a big pork, pork state, but uh, we've got a big kill plant in Southern California, so we bring a lot of cattle in, or I mean a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, pigs in to kill, so that's what most of those, most of those are slaughter. Here's our entry permits, again, the, lots of states. So let's talk again a little bit about our traceability tools. I know those of us in the West have relied on brucellosis tags for many, many, many years and they're still the, probably the best tool we have. We still currently require all heifers to be vaccinated in California, and it's often the only ID we find at slaughter or we're, when we're out doing an investigation, so it's still a very important piece of identification. The silver bright tag, obviously, it's that, and I think there's a lot of interest in getting those out a lot quicker for that first end of the bookend approach, and that's probably very important to consider. It's cheap. It can get out there. Uh, but, but I guess I would challenge those that say it's cheap and easy. I do agree. It's very cheap and easy to put in. But from that point forward, collecting that information on that tag is, is not so cheap because it means you've got to catch the head, you've got to read that, and you run that risk of transposing numbers, all those things. So I still think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly in favor. We push that initially and try to get as many of those tags out there as we can. But I think we have to remember it's not just that simple. It might give us that bookend if it's still in at the end of the, when we test animals or when we get them at slaughter, if that tag's still in there, it'll give us some information. But it's not, it's not the end-all answer, I think. Uh, official ID from Canada and Mexico, again, is usually pretty good, uh, but unfortunately sometimes it's removed. So we've got to work. We need, we need stiffer penalties. We need help and, and convincing industry that those are not to be removed. We're a brand state. We believe the brands play a very important purpose, but, it, but in reality the purpose is, is ownership. It's not really uh, individual animal identification. It, it works well as a supplemental. We use it a lot in the market. Sometimes we, we get to a pen lot. It's helpful to know what brands were, were in that lot that went to slaughter when we're tracing. But that hide is, is typically long gone once you've identified a suspect in the plant. It, it, it often isn't a lot of help. So I think it's, and it's not unique, uh, certainly, between states. And there's currently, I believe, only 14 brand states. So while I think it's important, it's a, it's a good piece of information. Uh, but I'm not sure it's going to really meet our needs solely uh, for, for individual animal ID. Again, uh, we, we put in about uh, 800,000 uh, tags a year in our, in our, he in our mainly our dairy heifers, uh, you know, significant number in our beef animals too. We put those in a database, so if one of those tags ends up in another state and you call us, we can generally tell you which veterinarian and what farm that tag was put in. And I think that's probably true with most of the states uh, that still have uh, brucellosis vaccination. 
We certainly utilize interstate certificates of veterinary inspection or CVIs, uh, health certificates. Uh, lots of those, we get them in, but unfortunately they're in paper format. Uh, we don't have, elect it's not data we can easily bring into a database. We don't have enough resources to enter all this information into a database. I know some states may do that. We don't have the, the resources to do that. Uh, so we got boxes of them if we need to, but obviously that's a pretty slow, slow system. International certificates, again, if, if animals are coming into California across the border, uh, Mexico border, USDA does send those directly to us. Again, we file them, we note them. If they're going anywhere we have concern about, we can follow up on them. Uh, but again, those are paper, paper records. We do utilize our brand records a lot. Uh, our, our brand program and our animal health program are in the same division, so we work very closely together. Uh, and those oftentimes are the best and very good information we have for movement of animals, uh, both intra and interstate. Uh, but again, those are in, typically it's still in paper format. Uh, permits, uh, when we issue permits to states for certain classes of cattle, we have that information. Uh, again, that's only interstate uh, movement, and then uh, again, the Mexico internationals. Uh, private testing for official programs, when uh, heifers are, are moved out of state or cattle have to be tested uh, for a specific disease or movement purposes, our accredited veterinarians are required to note that identification, bring it into us. And then certainly sale yard consignments, we use those routinely uh, for our disease uh, tracings. Some of the gaps, uh, you know, we're focusing limited resources now on where disease is. So some of the, the new changes in our brucellosis program, we're going to lose some of that first point testing. Uh, I think we can just, we understand that USDA doesn't have unlimited funds. So we've got, you know, certain regions of the country where we've got brucellosis. Some places have been free for many, many years. So I don't disagree that we need to move the resources where the, where the disease is. But by doing so, just as with, with brucellosis vaccination, as, as we're successful in eradicating brucellosis, we're losing some of those traceability tools and, and have fewer animals that are, that are identified and traced as they move interstate. Fewer states also require brucellosis vaccination, uh, so many of the females no longer have that ID. And then movement records often don't exist for certain classes of animals. Uh, again, Mexican and Canadian imports, especially if, in, if IDs removed, we don't know that that's where they came from. If an individual state's uh, in for, uh, tag is removed, sometimes you can't get back. Um, so those are, you know, anytime that, that ID is removed, that, that causes additional problems. Here, here's an animal that was locked up. It's got four silver tags in her ear. Uh, this animal obviously has moved around. Practitioners that are testing animals to move interstate or uh, for, for purposes, they don't like to read those little numbers any more than we do, so it's often easier for them to just grab a sequence of silver tags. Even though the animal's got one or two tags in, they'll put another one in just so they don't have to read those tags because they've got the sequence. It's easy for them to write them down on the papers, and, and they've, they've met their obligation for official ID. Although I, I, we probably all agree we'd rather have four tags than an animal than no tag, but it's just one of those, one of those issues we see. I think it's no, no secret that many dealers and traders don't maintain adequate records. Uh, you know, we talk about the ID device a lot. We haven't talked nearly as much about keeping the records and having access to those records, whether they're in paper format or maybe someday electronically, but that's still a piece of the puzzle that, that we really need. And again, as we said before, most of the official records we have are in paper format and not easily uh, searchable on a, on a database, you know, whether it's health certificates, brand inspection, or test records. And, and certainly most of our sale yard consignments are also in paper format. Other areas, you know, exhibitions often don't, need, uh, don't have uh, certain requirements. So we've got a lot of 4-H, FFA projects. We've got jackpot shows with animals moving around. Then the next one, I think, those of us in the states recognize we all need to work together, and that's something we, I think we all look forward to the next couple days. What are the standards? We've all got to come to agreement on standards, because 50 programs, I think we all agree, is not going to work. So we, you know, whether it's ID devices, whether it's premise IDs, you know, we've got to make sure our systems can, can work with each other and talk to each other, so I know we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, discussing that. And then certain classes of cattle will never have official ID or currently are required. You know, there, we, we had a little discussion in the West about, you know, should we have every animal ID'd in case one of those animals turns up with BSE or some other emerging disease that we don't even know about today down the road? And I think that's just a discussion we've got to have, you know, on the, on the benefit versus the cost. 
And I'm probably one of those guys that says, maybe we set the bar a little lower, we get good participation, we move forward with good support, and then we ratchet up you know, as, we, as we move forward. But again, those are things we're all gonna, we're all gonna discuss. This is a really busy slide, don't try to, not necessarily try to read it. But it's an example, back in 2002 and 2003, we, our first two herds we found with TB, one had excellent records, excellent identification, and we were able to feel very good about identifying the traces we needed to get to. And we ended up going back to 120. There's still a lot of, a lot of cattle, a lot of, a lot of traces, but we felt comfortable by going out and testing those 129 herds. We had a pretty good idea of, that we were getting to the, the trace outs that we needed and trace ins. The other herd had absolutely terrible ID, and we ended up coming to the conclusion we needed to do a three-county area test in order to perform the surveillance we felt necessary. And one of, our, one of our veterinarians looked at the numbers and compared the two and came to the conclusion that if, we could have, if we'd have had good traceability on both of those herds, we probably would have saved over $880,000 in needless tests because we ended up having to do you know, a huge, you know, over 600, almost 700 tests instead of that smaller number if we could have traced them. And it's not just government costs. You know, hundreds of producers had to lock up their cows and put up with the government on a couple different occasions uh, testing their animals and, uh, because we didn't have good ID. So it's not just a government cost, it's a producer cost as well. This is my only token slide to the, the sheep and goat industry, and my apologies to, to those of you in that industry. But this has been a very simple system, and, but it's had fairly broad industry support. And I think the main reason, and, and there's been a lot of low-tech stuff, a lot of different tags, but I think the reason it's worked is the industry understood how important it was to eliminate scrapie. And, and we had strong industry support for this program. So I want to use that example in a minute um, when we talk about, talk about TB again. Other issues, again, I'm, I'm not advocating we, we trace for any of these reasons, but I, I have very good relationships with both, unlike some of my counterparts, with both FDA and USDA, in my, I mean FSIS in my state. I work with them very carefully and very closely. I trust the folks locally. They trust me. We work very closely together. I got a call from the, 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 the I'm trying to think of his title, the director, I guess, of the California office for FSIS. He asked, he asked for some advice because they are now in the process, FSIS is, in enforcing their HACCP rule for residues. They've been focused on, on, the, on, on the microbial side ever since the mega reg went into, into effect years ago. But now they're also in the process of enforcing the the residue. So they've got a new list of residue violators out there, and part of a plant's HACCP plan is if they purchase an animal with residues, they've got to show the FSIS inspector what they're doing not to buy animals with residues again. It's hard to do that when you don't know the source of the animal with, from which you just got a residue. So they, the plants and FSIS are really trying to figure out how do we get back to the farm, back to the sale yard, and identify those dairies, in most cases in our state it's dairies, either cull cows or veal calves, where are those residues coming from? And if producers don't have good ID and don't have a record of no residues, they may lose access to their market for their cull cows. So we can debate whether traceability should include food safety issues. The reality, the marketplace at the plants, I think, is soon going to be driving those issues more and more. So. Again, I don't think that's necessarily an issue we as animal health officials need to, meet, need to be the drivers in, but we need to understand and producers need to understand without traceability, they may not have market access for their cull cows. So what I'm, you know, when, we, when we look about all the gaps and the, the process now, of where do we go from here, these are just, here's a very simple outline. You know, if we can identify and prioritize traceability needs for existing disease programs, and I really believe if our disease programs can be the driver of our traceability needs, I think we're all going to see the value uh, and, and have much better industry support to do that. I've already identified some of the traceability tools that, that are effective, some of the gaps. How do we fill those gaps? That's something we've got to talk about. And then, you know, we can talk about education, we can talk about outreach, but I think the real point is 
What do we tell a producer that they say, yes, I need to support traceability? And I think that's really what we need to seize. So I've got, I think, three slides left. Here, here's using the TB program as an example for why we need traceability. And I think we could walk through most of our existing disease programs in a similar manner. And I don't have all the answers here. I'm just using this as an example and a model, and maybe this is something to drive discussion. I would argue, having fought TB for many, many years, that this may be the national cattle disease that most of the industry can get behind. Uh, we don't know where all the, you know, it's a low-level infection. We've got, obviously, we've got uh, concerns with both beef and dairy. We've got evidence of, of spillover from, from captive cervids. We've got positive herds in the east, in the, in, the, in the upper Midwest, in central, in the west, in the south. We've got, we've got, we've got disease, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere. And, and I've shown you some examples of both cattle moving into the west cattle moving out of the West, so you know, we've, got, we've got movement all 50 states. So I think we, we certainly can argue that we need 50 state participation. We can identify existing effective traceability tools. Unfortunately, some of those are going away, but I've already talked about the Bruce Tags, the Silver Brights, a lot of RFID that the dairy industry and others are already using. And I think it's important, to, I agree, we need, we need to promote the simple and accept all, but I don't think we need to necessarily shy away from also promoting RFID tags or those tags that can give us better information faster, because the segments of the industry that are ready to use that and want to use that, we should definitely encourage them, them to use that. Um, and then for specifically for, for TB, what are those high-risk animals we need identified? In the West, we've been talking for years, we don't believe the status program anymore, that we believe there's TB uh, either in or passing through a lot of free states. I know California, many of my, my counterpart Western states have had a TB requirement on all dairy cattle, irrespective of class of, of the state, status of the state, for many, many years. Uh, and, and I still believe that's very justified. So breeding cattle, obviously, and I, over the years, I've, I've had many producers, producer groups say, if you guys just focus on the breeding cattle, we could get behind that. And, and, I, and, and I somewhat agree with that. I think that's a high-risk uh, group of cattle we need, we need identified. I talked about our Mexico and Canadian uh, imports, how important it is to identify those. Rodeo and event cattle, because they stay in the U.S. so much longer, obviously very, very important to identify. And then what are the high-risk movements where we need to capture that information? Herd of origin, certainly on the dairy side, I think that's something we need. When that calf or that, that heifer leaves, I, I think it's important. We had a resolution probably seven, eight years ago at USHA, actually sponsored, I think, by National Milk, saying every dairy heifer should be identified back to the herd of origin. I think that's still appropriate today. Anytime an animal is vaccinated, we need to capture that information, have it in a database we can use because there's ID. Interstate movement, USDA has already said that's an important piece. We agree. Anytime animals are tested for movement or investigation for sale, we've got to figure out a way to capture that information, make it available. And then, as I said before, collection of that ID at slaughter. We have a great system. Everybody does everything right. And then FSIS or the plant doesn't get us that information at slaughter. We've got a big TB lesion. And, yeah, it was a big black cow, but we don't have any idea where it came from. And, and we put, we, we're investing millions and millions of dollars in this program. And we, we, need, we need support FSIS to make sure we collect that information. So I think we really need to invest in that at the end. And then again, I don't think we talk enough about record keeping, but I think hopefully we, we, need, we may need some federal assistance to support database needs in each state, because I think some of us are different levels, but everybody needs to be at a, obviously at a certain level. We need link to the, our existing programs like brucellosis, like TB, like scrapie. Ensure standards among states. I think all of us in the states agree. And then move forward. I'm okay with starting with simple, but let's keep striving for better automation, better, better record keeping so we can, we can start at some point down the road, uh, reach that speed of commerce. And then again, it's not so much about educating or, or, or outreach as, as it is. I think talking straight and demonstrating to producers, if you want us to eradicate these diseases, we need traceability. It's that simple. So with that, I'll stop and appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts. I, I don't mean to oversimplify this issue. We've got a long way to go, but I, I really believe that focusing on these disease programs uh, can be a great start and get us a long way to where we need to go. And here's a couple of happy cows in California for you.